listening to Bad Dog Agility, bringing you training tips, interviews, and news about the great sport of dog agility. I'm Jennifer. I'm Esteban. And I'm Sarah. And this is episode 272. Today's podcast is brought to you by hitabar.com and the new Teach It, an easy to use tool that controls the amount of tip on your teeter so you can introduce motion to your dog in a gradual way. Just in time for winter training, order one now to receive a free feeding tray. You can also get $25 off a Hit It board and $50 off the Move It. Go to hitabar.com to get the holiday 2020 promo codes. That's hitabar.com. Today, we're going to continue our discussion of tunnels. Last week, we talked all about the tunnel itself. Um, I think we were surprised at how much we could talk about the obstacle itself, the bags, the color, and all things about the obstacle. And now we're going to continue and talk about the handling of the obstacle. Some of this is a little bit um, uh, hard to explain or talk about. So I kind of want to hit the the things that are a little easier where you know, it wouldn't be better served by say a demonstration video, okay. for example. Um, uh, so I want to start with straight versus curved. What are the handling implications here that uh, we're thinking about? Sarah, what do you think? Well, I think, uh, you know, a straight tunnel, um, it is really hard to keep up with the dog. Like uh, you're, you are essentially. That's why Jen's been torturing her students. <laughs> That's right. It is essentially a foot race at that point. There is nothing about that obstacle Unless you have a very large dog, which we've already covered, there's nothing about that obstacle that's going to slow your dog down. Mm. Um, Not only does it not slow them down, I think for a lot of dogs, it speeds them up because um, there's an expectation of by them. They know that they can run hard. They can see the exit. um, They don't have to be ready to turn. uh, Mm. And so they just accelerate towards that tunnel in in a way that uh, maybe they don't accelerate towards the next jump, for instance. Um, So really, it creates a lot of speed for the dog. The tunnels give the handler a chance almost always to catch up. And that the straight tunnels do the opposite. They are going to really exasperate any like differential between speed of the handler and the dog. I also think with curved and straight tunnels, when you start talking about dog mechanics, there's so much more variability on what you can do as a handler and what the dog can do physically on a straight tunnel. So on a curved tunnel, the lead the dog is in is forced based on the curve. So mm-hmm. if it's a curve to the right, they're on the right lead. If there's a curve to the left, they're on their left lead. There, That's it. It's done and over with. It's not until they exit that they can then respond to a handling cue or, you know, turn a particular direction. But a straight tunnel is you have the flexibility uh, through hand handling to cue anything you want. Um, You can get the dog on the left or the right lead, right? You can use your handling, you can use your location. So, you know, virtually everything that you can do at a single jump, you can almost do it a straight tunnel, where a curved tunnel is a little more limiting. If the tunnel curves one particular direction and you're on the backside of the curve, you know, again, without getting into a demo and a whole lot of understanding of the handling, but being on the backside of a curve and being on the inside of a curve are two totally different dynamics with regard to tunnel entries and tunnel exits. So that straight tunnel just gives so much versatility for handling. And as you said, I call the straight tunnel particle accelerator. Yep. Uh, they, they come out faster than they go in. So of course I love to, you know, make my students run, Esteban. Don't you want to <laughs> sign up for a class and come experience mm-hmm. it yourself? Yes, yes, I do. I will uh, and as, definitely it, do that. And as Jen mentioned earlier, it is relatively recent that the rule was changed to allow a third tunnel, but it has to be straight. It is meant to take the place of the chute. And so mm. the theory is, and I, I remember Jen mentioning this somewhere, uh, probably just when we were talking about um, stuff between the two of us, talking about agility, mentioning a theory that we might start seeing a lot more straight tunnels because it, it's a new addition to the rules, right? Mm. So if you are not comfortable with straight tunnels, if you haven't um, done a lot of handling with them, it is probably here in the United States, probably wise to uh, start getting that experience. Mm-hmm. And I think it's obvious, just like any other piece of equipment, you want to practice all your crosses on tunnels, both before and after fronts, blinds, uh, rear crosses, I think are especially tough one, but especially for handlers that have a big difference between your speed and the dog speed, right? The dog's much faster than you. I think you're going to have to learn how to rear cross uh, in a variety of situations, especially as it relates to the straight tunnel. You're one of Jen's students. You're not that mobile. Your dog's very fast. There's a big difference between your speeds. Yeah, you're, you're, you're going to have to 
learn to rear cross because there are going to be some times that you just can do what everybody else is doing. Um, I will uh, put it like that. Um, so verbal cues, uh, Jen, you've talked about uh, in recent podcasts, wanting to be uh, more verbal in your handling. Um, you know, that's something that I'm, I'm looking to as well. If I'm a beginner to agility and um, I'm putting my dog into a tunnel, when should I start cueing the next obstacle? When, when should the dog be hearing that cue? Should I be saying it before the dog even comes out? Can the dog even hear me when they're in the tunnel? Do I wait till they exit? Isn't that too late? Do I need to say before they go into the tunnel? Uh, do I give them two cues? Like, what's the deal here? I think if we answer the question that you asked, which is, I'm a beginner to agility, <laughs> I will answer it and say that I would cue the tunnel with just having a single tunnel verbal. Mm -hmm. And once the dog is in, once you know the dog is physically committed to the tunnel, use a verbal to help indicate where they're going. Now, that answers the question, but we could bring up a couple other things with regard to, well, what about the motion, making sure that the motion is consistent. If I want to turn, I'm going to decel or move lateral. In addition, to the verbal. And if you were to phrase it as, you know, maybe I'm more seasoned, I'm more experienced, I'm on my second or third dog, and I want to up my game a little bit, I do think we could look at the possibility of different tunnel verbals or verbals given prior to entry to help indicate a change in direction uh, for the dog. So, you know, we're, we're seeing more collection cues at jumps. We are now seeing people that will use a collection cue going into the tunnel. Um, you know, we know that not anything super recent, but we are seeing uh, specific uh, discrimination verbals uh, for a tunnel. So a beginner, I would always recommend have a tunnel cue and then a tunnel throttle cue. Um, but we are now seeing cues for tight turns. Some handlers will still cue the tunnel, but then use a verbal once the dog is in for soft turns, uh, different than a, a, a um, you know, check, check, check actually as a way to cue the tunnel to mean come out and turn tight. So mm -hmm. we're seeing a lot of different theory. Um, you know, for me personally, I'll just give personal firsthand experience. Um, I, I only have two tunnel verbals and it's tunnel. And then my discrimination verbal, which is here, um, everything else I'm using a combination of motion as they go in and a verbal once they're in. So do I use a verbal? Yes. I'm not going to wait till they come out because by then it's too late. They, they should be changing how they exit the tunnel based on where they're going. Um, but it is something that I get them committed and then I cue it. You know, if I were to holler for my dogs, right before they entered, they would turn right off of the tunnel. So I'm going to let them get in and then I'm going to holler a cue to help indicate to them what direction I want them to go. So kind of different skill sets depending on dog speed, handler's experience, but absolutely working turns out of tunnels versus going straight out of a tunnel. I mean, on a straight tunnel, Sarah said it before. I mean, it's an easy place to fall behind. I think for a lot of handlers um, on a straight tunnel, cueing the dog to go straight is the skill that's weaker. Out of a right. straight tunnel, people can get the turns. It's cueing the dogs to go straight. And then a, a curved tunnel, I, I kind of see the opposite. On a curved tunnel, um, that's where people need to work tighter turns out of a tunnel. Raising my hand right here and elimination at the world championships because <laughs> I did not get a tight enough turn out of a tunnel. And my dog went right off course. He mm -hmm. went straight, extended out. Um and I knew at that point I was going to do my next dogs differently and which I have, and it was going to have to be something that I worked on for sure. Yeah. And, and one thing that I, um, that I recommend when you have tight turns out of curved tunnels, um, is to, to give your dog some verbal to help find you. So sometimes it's the dog's name. Like if the dog is going to come out of the curved tunnel and then they have to turn sharply after, I think that's a pattern that we see a lot in agility. They go in one side, they come out the other. And when they come out, they have to turn sharply. And maybe there's an off course jump sitting where if they just came out of the tunnel and kept going straight, they'd go over that tunnel. And we have an entire podcast on connection, but I'll give you the one minute version, which is people um, don't. Uh, don't really think about their dog's point of view in the tunnel and recognize how extreme the dog's disconnection is when they go into tunnels. Mm -hmm. They disconnect from the handler. They cannot see you. Um, they disconnect from the course. They When they come out of the tunnel, I mean, imagine just going from dark to light and then ha at running at full speed, right? 
like running at full speed, going from darkish to light. And then the entire course is suddenly in front of you again. And you're trying to figure out what the next thing is, right? They have lost their perception of where all of the obstacles are in relation to each other. Your dog pays attention to that stuff on course. And when they come out, they have to do that very, very quickly. They have to figure out which of the humans out there is their handler. Like we definitely see dogs coming out of tunnels and occasionally accidentally running over to the judge. Yes, because they the turn judge toward the judge. If the judge is be, on the opposite side, they, right. they catch him out of the corner of the eye and then they- And then they realize, right? So you need to recognize that you need to work hard to make that connection. You need to recognize that verbal helps because while they can see nothing in the tunnel, they can hear. And we have done this, we had an argument in our training group about how useful it was to, um, to give our dogs any verbal while they were in the tunnel. And I crawled into a tunnel and, um, and had training partners walking at different points. And I would point to where they were when they just called my name and I could pinpoint them accurately, right? I could tell where the person was while I was inside the tunnel. So that's something that is really helpful to your dog. So if I have a tight turn out of the tunnel and my dog is inside probably. the tunnel. Pro- I'm going to say probably okay, because fine. your ears are located in different positions from your dogs. Okay. Dogs have a he- hearing range is very different okay. and all that stuff. But Okay. But on this working theory, I am going to advise people to, you know, if you have a tight turn out of the tunnel, while they're in the tunnel, you can call, you can be calling their sure. name. And then as soon as they come out, and they orient to you, then you can give them the um, the cue for the next obstacle. Yeah. I only dimly recall that uh, demonstration. I'm just going to assume whatever I said was the right thing. So, <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll, we'll just, uh, we'll just uh, move on from there. Um, uh, getting back a little bit to what Jennifer was saying, you know, there's a predictability that needs to happen on the part of the handler, not the dog, right? We blame the dog a lot for turning this way or that way. I'm telling you, if you send, submit a video to me for analysis and your dog turns the wrong way out of the tunnel and you're on the other side, and you're like, why does the dog keep doing this? Well, it's because the dog expected you to be there. Okay. So based on your motion and position, if you take a handler like Jennifer, it's going to be very consistent. You know, if she does this right before you go into the tunnel, and this is the last picture snapshot that the dog takes and sees, it's very predictable to her dogs that she's going to be most likely in a certain couple of spots and not very sure, not a couple of other spots, right? Just based on what the dogs know about all this history of running with Jennifer, right? And so that's where we need to be very uh, consistent with the dogs and really really handle these tunnels like the obstacles that they are and not really just take them for granted and assume that they're going to do this, that, or uh, the other. All right. The last main handling point that I wanted to make that I think we can talk about is that, uh, people often talk about their dogs being tunnel suckers, right? Uh, but in my experience, as, as courses become more complex and we run into issues and we are looking to save yardage for the handler, we're looking to send a little bit more, right? We want the dog to do all the running. We want to run a little bit less and start moving in the new direction. We are getting tunnel refusals now, right? So we're kind of shifting a little bit the other way. We're shifting away from these off courses. So what's really going on here? Uh, I think two things. So number one is dogs aren't committed as committed to tunnels as a lot of people assume, right? And so you can definitely uh, be pulling your dog off tunnels. And two, the off courses often are not because your dog loves tunnels. It's just because your handling is a little poorly timed, right? It's a little reactive and not uh, proactive. Jennifer, what are your thoughts on tunnel, tunnel commitment and, and how courses look today? I think tunnels are going to be one of the spots that you can most utilize as an opportunity to get ahead, at least here in the United States. Exactly. Um, I think the the use of tunnels here in the United States, I find to be very different than the use of tunnels overseas. That could, mm-hmm. that could be a whole nother podcast in and of itself. But if we're talking here, what we're commonly seeing, what many of our listeners are seeing, you're going to see tunnels as a tremendous opportunity to get ahead of your dog, to get downstream, to make it for that front or blind cross. If you have that tunnel send in that tunnel commitment, um, we often see them in the corners and why run all the way to the corner when you can send your dog to the tunnel, let them go out. I mean, that's potentially 15 or 20 feet. And that's just the length of the tunnel that you don't have to travel, right? You know, at least they have that long to travel 
uh, let alone the distance going out to that tunnel and then returning from the tunnel to the next obstacle. So having an incredible tunnel send and having incredible tunnel commitment is something that I work a lot on both with my own dogs and with my students' dogs. I think the fear is that if I at a dead standstill can send my dog 30 feet to a tunnel, that that is going to create tunnel sucking, as you said, but it's always cued, right? Mm -hmm. What I'm not going to do is, is, you know, decelerate um, and then holler tunnel as much as I can do it. I would say tunnel first and then decelerate. Then, yeah, then you right? do whatever you want. It's the order of events. I think a lot of people decel, holler tunnel. If they do this enough, as you mentioned about the consistency, then the dog learns, okay, handler decels, I go to that tunnel in front of me. Handler decels, I go to that tunnel in front of me. Next thing you know, you're decelling to try to cue the dog to turn off of the tunnel. And the dog goes, wait a minute, I got this. Last time she decelled, she then hollered tunnel. So I bet she's going to do the same thing here. So, you know, Mm -hmm. making sure to say tunnel early and maintaining that commitment and also making sure to do plenty of exercises where they're not to assume just because it's there that they're going. It's as with everything, it's a balancing act, you know, but I absolutely think the tunnel is probably one of the single best places. May, maybe we pull independence where a handler can utilize to get ahead and get downstream. Yeah. I think, I don't think we can give that up. Right. I think that it is, it is such an opportunity for the handler that it's not something that we want to give up that ability to send to the tunnel. And like you said, like weave poles is a great opportunity to um, get some space from your dog a lot harder, right? A a dog cannot come out of the middle of a tunnel. Let's just put it that way, right? Your dog cannot come out of the middle of the tunnel. They can come out of the middle of the weave. So so a send to a tunnel is by its very nature, an easier thing to teach the dog. So Mm -hmm. um, definitely I would would, um, spend some time getting that commitment to the tunnel and getting that um, speed and drive. And and like we said before, the the vast majority of dogs seem to enjoy the tunnel, right? Right. I don't know that I would say the vast majority of dogs enjoy weaving. I think it's something that they do. Oh yeah, definitely. Think, you know, they do it, but I'm not sure that it's like, okay, let's put it another way. When we let our dogs run around the yard free, sometimes they take <laughs> tunnels. I have never once seen them take weaves. Okay. So I, I think I'm, I'm on pretty good, solid, yeah, yeah. logical ground here. Right. And so when you take an obstacle that your dog loves, that once they're in it, they're forced to finish it, right? That is a fantastic obstacle for you, even if you have nothing else in your skill set that involves sending your dog far away from you. That is someplace you can probably do it. Right, right. All that's right. my pep talk. Yep, that's a great pep talk. All right, and to uh, 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 finish up with this, uh, the the discussion of handling and these tunnels. Uh, tunnel discriminations where you have a curved tunnel at the end of a long line of jumps, you know, one, two, three jumps, and then maybe it's pointed, that line is pointed at the wrong end and you need to take the other end. And sometimes it's pointed at the right end. And, and you just need to know, I think that you basically have three things that you need to be able to do with your dog when they're, when you're presented with that sequence, with that setup, with that challenge, your dog has got to be able to take one end. It's got to be able to take the other end, right? And those two cues should probably look and, and sound different from each other. And uh, there needs to be the third option, which is the dog's not supposed to take the tunnel at all. And there's maybe a 90 degree turn to another obstacle, like a jump or a teeter or something like that, where the tunnel is in fact a trap. And the judge is trying to get you into either end of those uh, of that tunnel uh, to get you off course. So you want to keep that in mind uh, for your handling. Now for that, I suggest you go to baddogagility.com, type it in the search engine, uh, tunnel, tunnel discrimination. That'll probably get you there. Uh, maybe tunnel course. And that'll pull you up some sequences, demonstration videos. I'll put some in the show notes too, because we definitely have some examples of that. That'll be great too. So if you've got dogs that are, you're struggling with the discrimination there, they're going in the wrong end, especially after these long lines, uh, definitely go and check that out. I think that's much better explained uh, with video and uh, demonstration. And I'm pretty sure we have an entire um, Facebook live on blind tunnel entries as well, which we didn't, we touched on a little bit with the extreme angles, but basically when the dog is trying to go into a tunnel and they can't see the entrance, that's not something that we really get here in the United States, but it is something that we um, right. see so, overseas So you'll put that in the show notes page for everyone, right? Show notes, yep. All right. And with that, I think we are, are going to wrap up now the most comprehensive podcast that I've certainly ever heard or done on uh, tunnels. All right. That's it for this week's podcast. We'd like to thank our sponsor, hitaboard.com. Happy training.